thanks for being here, and uh, I'm so excited that I get to do this. Thanks for doing this, Fred. Uh, so the first, you know, so the, the show you had, the special four, right? I've seen different versions of it. Like, I've seen it in some uh, smaller venues in, in Los Angeles and, um, you know, uh, then uh, at the Greek or the Hollywood Bowl, and then, you know, it's, it's kept going. And every time I've seen it, I always feel like it's like a special show that is not part of, of your stand-up. Like, the, your, the, your tone always feels like, okay, I'm going to talk to you privately. It's like it feels like a very personal experience. How are you, then when I watch the special, it still feels that way. How are you able to make each night feel like, okay, this is like, you know, it's almost like a side show. Like, this isn't the real show. I'm just going to talk to you. Oh, like in a movie when someone's like, I had a whole speech prepared. Yeah. I, I just need to, like, <laughs> yeah, talk yeah. from the heart. Yeah. Uh, well, that's very nice of you to say. I certainly was kind of, I certainly was hoping for a different tone. Um, and the tone I was hoping for was, we're in an arena, but this is a private conversation. <laughs> and, I'd, and, and a bit of like, and I'd appreciate if you didn't repeat this, but <laughs> you might repeat some of it, but like, please, I'm, yeah, just shut the door, I'm like speaking to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that was a really fun uh, way to, this is a way, fun way to be on stage. Um, I don't, I'm not sure why it comes naturally to feel very comfortable talking like intimately to an audience. Mm -hmm. It does. I mean, I, I'm much more comfortable talking to a lot of people about something than one or two. And uh, I, that might be a real sickness and it might be part of my, <laughs> <laughs> it might be a big part of my uh, overall problem. Um, but it, it nevertheless is true, and uh, the thing with a tour that was so long was how to uh, keep that up and, and how to not get into, okay, we're in Moncton, Canada, in a hockey arena, and um, I know the show really well, and I want to just say it conversationally to everyone. Um, but uh, yeah, doing it night after night was more of the challenge. It wasn't so much the doing it, it was doing it night after night. But I'd get to some details in the story that are so just not, uh, they can't be performed through, you know? <laughs> yeah. They're just like, okay, so I have to back up and tell you that at this point, you know, I had lied to this person, I'd stolen this amount of money from this person, and I was lying to my accountant, and it gets so, uh, it gets so ultra-specific that it, it, it would ground me night to night. <laughs> I don't know why I would assume that people in other countries wouldn't be able to sort of connect in the same way that an American audience would. But you went to Australia, you've like, you've, you toured this around the world. Was it the same kind of reaction? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yes. <laughs> you, you know what well, I let mean? Let me think. Like, it, it, um, it, it, you know, Amsterdam, mm -hmm. not a good show. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> like, just flat. Uh, just not, and I don't think it's anything about the, you know, uh, they're famously bad over there, right? Like, like mm -hmm. they have a lot of vice or whatever. But uh, it didn't feel like a, a culture clash with that. Um, but my tour manager, uh, Betsy, was side stage, and when one of the first openers walked out and was getting nothing, she went, I forgot they're bad here. <laughs> <laughs> so that, Amsterdam was a, was, uh, was a tough one. But Sweden um, and uh, <laughs> Copenhagen, uh -huh. Copenhagen, um, you know, they really cheered for me when I would have some petty victory, like in the, in the story <laughs> of the intervention, when I'd be like, and I said, like, fuck you guys. And it's a moment yeah. where I'm like a real, you were there. I was <laughs> <laughs> like, I was a really, it was a sad, uh, uh, messy person speaking, but in, in, in Copenhagen, they would cheer for those moments, you know? Interesting. And I was like, I'm not going to rehab, and they'd be like, yeah. yes! <laughs> of all Wrong places. Man. Yeah. Um, I remember after you played, first, I'm going to assume everyone has seen the special, right? <laughs> oh, that's nice. Uh, we could, has anyone not seen it? That's okay. That's okay. Just curious, because I could walk you through what happens in it. It's, <laughs> it's 80 minutes, but we could do it fast. 
I remember when you played Madison Square Garden. I was blown away by like how technically a person can speak on a stage there. Like, it's one thing to be in a theater and you can kind of sort of work the room. What are you, what are you looking at? Or what, what, do you, what is different about being in a place that size? Um, well, I was curious, how did it come off in Madison Square Garden? I, oh no, I only heard. Did it heard, feel like a show? I, I, I didn't go to that show. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Well, you saw Hollywood Bowl? Yeah. Did that feel like a stand-up show, or did that feel like me yelling at the ocean? No. <laughs> that felt like a stand-up show, but, you know, the seating is kind of like this, and, like, you know, it's, it, yeah. it's, 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 it feels small in its own way. But the garden is like an arena that's, like, all around you. That was, like, no joke had to go to a different place mentally where ev all humility and um, self-deprecation had to fade away and I had to be like, uh, like mega church. Uh, <laughs> like, like, you know, stay in the moment of the show. I don't mean like act that differently, but I had to be like, there's no other way to, I think, uh, uh, comport yourself mentally than to be like, I definitely everyone should be listening to me right now. Because it's, so, it's so many people, it's laughable that for some reason one person's talking. <laughs> That's exactly what I mean. And just talking about like recent events in their yeah. life for a while. And someone, someone is way, way up. Yes. Someone's and way, they bought yeah. a ticket and they're like, I'm yeah. at a distance. Like way down, yeah. yeah. Um, does, does the volume of your voice go up at all? It, like, did you notice any physical differences? As um, well? In the beginning, I was yelling like, uh, like I wasn't mic'd when I started those yeah. arenas. But you know, we had these big portrait-sized screens. Um, and they, uh, they, were, they were really long, and that, I think, helped a lot. Like, it, it somehow, uh, versus being up on the, like, Jumbotron, which you can be, uh, that had some, I, I sensed, like, I think this is intimate even for the people in the back. I, I hoped, you know. Do you have monitors? Are they, like, do you hear your Yeah, story? but, you know, I'm not, I don't know uh, what to do with monitors, because I'm always like, if I can't hear me, do I want it louder in the monitor? Right. Or do I want it lower so that I hear the way my voice sounds in the room? Um, but yeah, you but you don't, want to be, you don't want to be like shouting too much. No, uh, because you're mic'd. Yeah. Um, side note, this is a total side note. Yeah. It has nothing to do with stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes if you go, uh, this does not leave this room. You go, if, you, if you go to another country sometimes, I love, it's great to travel. Some, uh, sometimes on their like sketch shows and variety shows, they scream into their mics. Yes. I don't know, they don't understand that it's being picked up. With all due respect to other nations. Uh, but sometimes I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. You have a mic. I know. It's like exclamation point. <laughs> uh, do you have like, a set list on stage with you? How do you remember? It, it's a lot. For this show? For, um, for your stand-up. So in general, when, when I had um, tours or uh, shows that were, you know, there might be kind of a flow to them, but it was basically interchangeable bits. And, I, and in my head, there was sort of like a, not a story, but there was some progression in each hour of, but I don't think it ever translated to anyone, and no one cared. But I, I sort of thought like, oh, in the beginning of the special, I'm like this, and at the end, I'm a little. This one was easy to remember because it was everything from like one night forward. Oh, right. It's and like then a I schedule. was, yeah, yeah. It was so like it was, it was getting. There was a point where it was like minute by minute, mm -hmm. um, and I guess it stayed that way to some degree. So uh, talking about from when I got into the intervention to showing up at rehab to the to the couple months I was there. Mm -hmm. um, that was, that was fairly easy to remember the, the chain of events. <laughs> but seriously, and then, and yeah, then, I mean, and then whenever I would try to have a couple jokes on either side of the story, then it was like, you know, then those were interchangeable and I, I would need to remember them. Did you ever come off stage and think, oh, damn it, I forgot a story? Yeah, and I would forget setups to <laughs> stories. Uh, like, I, I had a story um, about, on my way, after the intervention, after you guys won, I, 
<laughs> um, I went in the, do you remember at one point I went, is there a car downstairs? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was so <laughs> mad. There was an SUV waiting downstairs. I was so mad. Um, and uh, in, then we stopped at a gas station. We, me, uh, I stopped at a gas station. <laughs> And I um, did some cocaine off of a koala baby changing station in the bathroom. Okay. Um, so that's just a detail in the show. And then um, later in the uh, show, this really happened. I was at the Detroit Art Museum uh, with my son. Uh, he was about six months old, and I was pushing him around. And uh, he went to the bathroom, and I had to change him. And I went into a bathroom, and for the first time as a parent alone, had to use a koala baby changing station. And mm. at that point in, and, and not, as, not for drugs, and I, at that point, <coughs> in the, at that point after 70 minutes on stage, I always thought, one, it's true, and it was quite funny to me when it happened, but I thought it had a nice moment uh, recalling how I used to use them. But I forgot the first part one night. And so <laughs> we're 70 minutes into the show, and, I and I'm like, and I pushed my son into the bathroom, <laughs> and I looked on the wall, <laughs> Everyone's and I'm like, holding everyone's like, mm -hmm. yes, and and I'm like, and there it was, and like I, I kept being like, why do I need to finish the sentence? Don't you all know what I'm talking about? And I was like, there was the baby changing station, <laughs> and I changed the baby the diaper. changing station, yeah. and they're like, oh, he has no sense of what's funny. <laughs> we, uh, when I was watching the the newest special. It, you know, the way you dress is so, it's like really, you know, it's impeccable. Like you really like, really do wear a suit. You don't like throw one on like, hey, I should dress nice. I don't, I have a hard time thinking about how hard, that, that part must be really hard. For, for me, I like to wear something comfortable, you know, like presentational, but you're really like zit. Yeah. Do you, um, First of all, do you bring like just a, like, is it like a whole closet of wardrobe to switch around? Is there any, yeah, or is, is there any part of you that's like, I gotta take it easy, you know, I gotta relax a little bit? Oh, okay, yes to all. So uh, <laughs> there's many nights where I go, why did I start doing this? Uh, I'm like, I'm at like the um, Hollywood, Florida, Hard Rock, Seminole Casino, I, I've like, <laughs> I've just had like a burger. I don't want to put on a suit. Like I feel, uh, you know, all these other comedians get to come out in. I always uh, 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 act um, uh, like I'm being victimized by a situation I set in motion many years ago. <laughs> yeah. That no one's, that's not like, wouldn't be breaking the law if I didn't wear a suit. Um, then I go like, oh, people will be mad if I don't have it on. And I have this whole I I thing in my head about it. Um, By but, the way, it looks great. I didn't mean it oh, like why. I meant no, more like, no, no, I that, that seems like a big part of it. It, it, it seems to be, yeah. Um, and it makes it way easier. Did you ever have a uniform in school when you were a kid? Yeah, there, were, uh, there was uniforms for different jobs I've had in my life. Yeah. Um, so you? yes, but in school, Elementary school and high school, no, no. Okay, so like in elementary school. No, actually, I'm gonna make up a story. Okay. We had, <coughs> because, uh, I was raised in Venezuela and we had military uniforms. Yeah. It was hardcore, that's that was all, it was really just dark. military stuff. That was a scary time. Scary time. But you're, were... but you're a kid, so you're like. Maybe this is normal. This is, this is... <laughs> and you were disappeared over and over again, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's a language to that. There's a sort of ballet to being disappeared that <laughs> everyone's used to. Um, um, so it makes it easier to wear a suit, and <laughs> I have a bunch of them, and, uh, and, I, and, once I, and it's, it, it's overall easier. Because yeah. then you don't have to make a decision about wearing something casual. Don't you find that hard? Totally. You go, what am I going to do, button-down shirt? Uh, it's a lot of thinking. This was a nightmare. I hate this. Yeah. I really do. I really, this is a, this is a type of in-between clothing that stresses me out. Like, what does this mean? I, was I like washing my hands like a doctor and then came I'm out? I'm so, I am but so with you. this is a choice. This isn't natural. I didn't need to roll these up. I did this and like it's fold, it's, you know. The hard part is that like we're sitting too. So I that's know. like, what I was what thinking you? about what would look what. Yeah. So that's what I did. I, you know, because I'm traveling too. Right. So I was like, I don't want to wear a tie 
But I wear this, it looks kind of uh, like it's a button down. Right. And a suit jacket. Yeah. So it's, all, it's, just, it's like a halfway decision. It's like kind of casual, but also tonight isn't about me, so I thought I could like, <laughs> it's okay if, if it's not, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if, even if I was in your position, I think it's about me. Like I would, uh, <laughs> I really do. I really thought a lot about it. I actually traveled here with a lot of this. There's a gray sweater in the hotel. There's a, um, you know, like a, a shirt with three buttons that's soft like a sweater and has a collar? Yeah. That was tried on around 3 p.m. <laughs> that was no good. I like any shirt that's like a little bit of like, it's almost like a jacket and, and a shirt at the same I know. time. I like jackets so much. Same here. And a big thing is when I was a, in high school, um, I went to a really strict uh, Jesuit Catholic high school and you would get detention if your shirt was untucked even a little. And detention was called Jug, which stood for Justice Under God. Oh my and, God. Yeah, so, if you, so that's why. Uh, so um, I have, uh, so sweaters, anything that would cover, because even if your shirt tail was out a little, you could just get, like your whole day would be ruined by these sons of bitches. Uh, and, you're, and you're 14 and it's so, you're so tired and dehydrated and they would just, it was awful and you'd walk down the hall, it was so stressful. So <laughs> any sweater I like and any jacket is great because it could hide a little bit of untucking if you needed to. Yeah. I like jacket weather, I get very stressed out when it's over. Same, as soon as summer rolls around. Where do you put anything? In your pants yeah. pockets? How do people do it? I don't know. Because I need... Pocket here. Yep. Pocket. I just like, even here, I like. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then when it's like, when you walk down the street in the summer and everything's in these pockets. It's, it's weird. It looks, like a, it looks like you're a thief. <laughs> <laughs> I just reached into this pocket and then I remembered that I've got questions from the audience. Whoa. That I'm going to shred. <laughs> because we don't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, will you get my? Oh. <laughs> oh someone run, so someone knows. He's someone so knows old. what to do. Um, okay, I have not seen any of these yet. Um, okay. Um, I'll just start at the top. Is it fair to say you've read a book when you really listened to the audiobook, or is that cheating? This is from Julian. <laughs> oh. That's a really good, um, it is cheating, but it's, there's nothing wrong with an audiobook, uh, and I think, but it is cheating. Because I'm doing both right now. I have an audiobook that I'm listening to, and I have a book that I'm reading, and guess what gets more time? The audiobook. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, because it is harder to read, because you have to squint, you have to look at it, and so it is cheating. What do you think? I think there's a, just a different, um, uh, like a, it's, it's just a different category. Uh -huh. So it's like, these are two different things. Like I read the book, you could almost have done them both. Okay. I just think it's like, so yes, it, yes it's cheating, but it doesn't count against you. Okay, how do you feel about if you listen to a podcast and you hear information on the podcast then saying, someone told me? Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a big, I do that a lot. Yeah. And, but on the other hand, if we really want to discuss this, technically, they really did tell you. Yep. They're like, that was, you know. It implies I know people that know things, but, yeah. but now here's another interesting rub. You and I are in entertainment, and um, I calculated backstage, 98% of our friends have podcasts. Do you, ever, do you ever listen to our friends on a podcast and then think, you like had a, does you ever go like, I've had a conversation with them? It, I could hear part of their voice go into the mode of interviews. Oh, Sometimes that's I can right. like, I could hear like, oh, I think I've heard that tone on Conan or something, like right. when we were on Conan. So you're not, you're not, it's not like hearing them. No, uh, but let's say, f let's take, I don't know, Maya, for example. Okay. It's still Maya. I'm like, oh, that's still her. Right. You know, so it's like, it's like a combo. Why, what is your opinion on it? Um, so I think being, being uh, 
having a, having a baby and not having a lot of time for socializing, I now will, I'll now check off. If I listen to a friend on a podcast, I'll, oh, wow. I'll kind of, like, I don't, not like I don't need to nurture these friendships, but it, my brain just goes like, we've had dinner with them. You know? Wow, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is another question. My daughter is starting college in the fall. She's here with me. What advice can you give her that she will listen to as she won't listen to me? Um, so the, for the person that that is, uh, do you mean advice about college? Her experience. Her experience. You mean, um, <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, did, uh, let me think about that. I don't want to just say something fast uh, when, you know, your daughter's going to take this to heart and follow it absolutely. <laughs> what do I wish I'd known when I went to college? Oh, it's, um, it's a, like, it's, a university has so many resources. Wait, this is not going to be a very, this is going to be a very boring answer, but a university has so many resources, and, like, um, people come to speak, go see a lot of speakers. It's, it's, um, Use as much of the university as you can because it's a really good resource for your own, for your own interests as well. Um, I think uh, I went to a good college and didn't always take advantage of it. Uh, and I think I regret that, although everything worked out fine. <laughs> um, so I don't know. There's that. And uh, I don't know. What advice would you have? Well, I'm going to ask first. How do you know that she's not listening to you? She might be listening to you. I think people pretend to not listen, but I'm sure she's taking some of it to heart. Yeah. What advice have you given her that you feel f fell on? <laughs> what advice have you given her that you thought fell on deaf ears? You want her to have fun and you fear she won't? <laughs> Do you know those kids that need to be told to have fun? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's always a thing. Like, my, my, co uh, my college was a, a military college. That was like, <laughs> and, and so we were told to have fun, but like it was so, it was that's, all that's, training, that's training, cool. training, training, training. That sucks. Training, training, and you know. That's really You know, like this? Yeah. <laughs> Through the dirt. Through the, uh, uh. <laughs> and running in tires. <laughs> they have to get tires. They have, the military has to get so many tires. I know. Like, like why do we need, you'll see. Yeah. Kind of like this. Um, where is she going to school? Oh, nice. Great. It'll be fun. Although we would have acted positive no matter what school you said, you know? <laughs> um, I have a separate question from this. Since you've done your, since you performed all over the place, and I'm not, this is not putting anyone down who approaches you and wants to talk to you. Have you found more people wanting to speak seriously with you, like in hushed, like? Yes, about yeah. like about perhaps if they're in recovery or doing. Yeah, or yeah. Or, or or whatever. Yeah, like it's very it, nice. Okay, great. <gasps> okay, there's been a uh, there've been four celebrity deaths. <laughs> This is wild. Whoa. Wow. Since we started? Same location, unrelated to each other. <laughs> How wild. Um, no, uh, this is a, just a lovely birthday card from, uh, it, it was my birthday in December. Oh, yeah. So, so sweet. That's so funny. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> uh, this is for John. Um, no, seriously, it's, it's a caricature. Um, uh, <laughs> Someone did. Yeah. It's, it's really good. It's, um, it's Duke Ellington with yeah. a big piano. It's really beautiful. <laughs> oh, it's really Duke. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, for John, uh, what is something you miss about living in New York? Oh, um, yeah. I, people doing pull-ups on scaffolding. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, I really do, I miss that a lot. Scaffolding, I miss. It gives you a break, you know? Like, um, you're walking down the street and suddenly we're in a fort. <laughs> <sighs> 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 
and people like, um, like uh, I think, daily interactions with unreasonable people. <laughs> Do you remember when we met I, Curtis Sliwa? Oh, yeah. Yeah, wasn't that crazy? That was wild. It was like all of like, my perception of New York yeah. in one moment. And he was wearing the jacket and the beret. If you don't know who that is, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Curtis but he's like, he seems like almost like the most New York to me in a way, just of like his existence. Yeah, right? like he thinks the most about the city. Like every day he's getting up and being like, this city, I gotta clean up this city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, and that's his existence. Every I mean, day, like, every it's day. It's so like, utopian. Yeah. I'm going to clean it up. Yeah. I'm These people should it. be behind it's, bars. Yeah, yeah. There's bad people. Out. <laughs> but we're not making fun of them. I'm just saying it's No, no, admirable. it's like there's a purity to it. There's, a pu there's like a, a sort of a, a, a monk-like uh, existence yeah. to wearing that satin jacket and yeah. being like... You know what I, by the way, not that anyone asked, but I don't live in New York anymore either, and what I miss, <laughs> that's all right, uh, what I miss is uh, poorly taken care of food given to you, and you accept it happily, you know, like, because just because you you're hungry, because so, there's like a, you know, like a really like a congealed lasagna or something like in the, or a sandwich that's just been yeah. there, and it's just like, what do you want? And then you just, they, they give it to you, and you eat it happily, I like not pride in food. I'm so, yeah. like, so as I've traveled, uh, I just, I'm, I'm sort of tired of how proud everyone is of how well they've made something. Yeah. And in New York, I don't know, it's a, that, that one? Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm happy, they're happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no show of what they yeah. made. <laughs> and I miss that. They're not like, let me whip something up. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Or like just so you know. We don't you know. have that. No. Um, my name's Marty, and I'm in the balcony. Ooh. Oh, shoot. This is for the four of us. That's okay. For the four of you, should, uh, should I wait? I gotta bring him out anyway. Yeah. Let's Damn. just wait. Okay, let's wait. I gotta bring him out anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, but I'm uh, so excited about this. Uh, we'd like to bring out some more guests. Uh, the director of the special, Alex Timbers, and David Byrne. Pow! <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so we'll just start with there was a, an audience question. Well, can I say something real fast? I, we just, I don't think we have, I, th I don't think we have enough time. <laughs> I, I, I just want to thank David. David did, first off, thank you, Alex, because you directed Thanks. an incredible special. But I also, I, I, David did some original music for this special, and it meant a lot to me. It was a very big deal. Thank you. I have a thought about the suit question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, years ago, I thought, I want to look completely normal, and so that People won't, will not uh, have a bias when, they, when I start doing, saying something weird or I mean, my singing was weird or the songs I was singing were weird. And I thought, if I wear a suit, it, it likes, they'll, they won't suspect anything. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, yeah. They'll think, he's a respectable, normal guy. <laughs> we have to listen to what he has, has to say. So I thought, that's a reason to wear a suit. That, that kind of was. I was doing a stand-up at this place, The Laughing Skull in Atlanta, and there were um, 20 people in the audience, and I had on a flannel shirt and jeans, and they all had on flannel shirts and jeans, and it was, I was like, there's no reason why any of them shouldn't switch places with me. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I started wearing a suit for that reason. But did you, I don't, sorry to put you on the spot, but did you call your stage character Mr. Man? Was that something I might have read once. 
I don't think so. Oh, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> well, I thought I heard that once, and I remember thinking, like, oh, that's a great, like, I kind of, even though it's not true, I, <laughs> I, I, like, I really thought about that a lot of, like, yeah, like, I'm this, like, I'm going to be this, like, fake authority figure in my suit. Yeah. So you, you've inspired that. All right. Yeah. Sometimes they have a thing at uh, SNL on show night where the writers, not sometimes, all the time, the writers traditionally will, will wear like a suit. Yeah. And it does give like a feeling of like uh, authority and, and professionalism that I got to say is pretty nice. It is nice. And I remember because we were like 24 and we had to be on the, um, on the floor of Studio 8H kind of like arguing with very, you know, like mob connected union people. And <laughs> like we had to go toe to toe with, um, you know, with like tough guys that were in charge of moving the crane cam, you know. And so you, you, we thought this gave us some authority. Yeah. It probably made us even more insufferable and unlikable. <laughs> um, well, before I get to this, Alex, I, I wanted to ask you about something. Sure. The very first shot of the special. It's like a, it looks like a crane shot or something. It's, a, it's of John, front of stage, and there's an audience there, and it's just like close on, and then yeah. it swoops around. How did you uh, get away with it without the audience being like, why am I looking at a crane? Uh, that's a great question. I think you know, John had this great idea of not wanting to have a cold open, of just diving right into the material. And, uh, and so we wanted to figure out how to establish that amazing room that John was so excited about and that incredible pipe organ, and then figure out a series of sort of theatrical reveals, John stepping into frame and then revealing the audience. I think they were really, I don't know, what do you think? They were really excited but to be a part The Steadicam of operator, they, um, you know, it actually bought me a kind of a cheated laugh because there's a, a little hum of laughter as we fade in mm -hmm. in the very beginning of the special, and it seems like I've just said something Funny, but it's not. It's just that <laughs> all of a sudden the Steadicam operator was probably right, you know, right at the right at center stage, and I was stepping into the shot, and there was something like choreographed about it, which yep. amused them, and so it seems like you know, like oh, I'm mid killing, you know, and <laughs> it wasn't true. And it's not just the Steadicam operator; he's got a little protector. Oh yeah, he had a like, protector. This oh, like a sort of guide. Yeah, making yeah. sure he doesn't hit anything. Um, yeah. That looks great, and also the. Um, on the sides of the stages, there's like these like lights um, that, are, that look sort of hidden, and they like in a subtle way change color throughout. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this that, guy's all about that. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. So we wanted to take that that amazing room that John fell in love with, and then make it sort of come up, come alive. So we had this uh, production designer Scott Pask who built like a, a set within it that looked like it belonged in the room, but was covered in LED neoflex that could change color. And then we had these fixtures called pickle pats that are also LED and they, they could change throughout the show. So we could uh, chart the whole journey through it. It was really fun. Neoflex is really cool. You got to get some of it. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? It's like a you, you, it's an LED tube neon. Yeah. yeah. Like it, it looked like, I mean, it's more common, but it looked like strips of just, it's almost like strips of tape they would lay down and then. Are, have I seen them at shows sometimes? Do, are bands using them? Yeah. Who, was the, who did we look at on Letterman? We looked at Charlie XCX's yeah. performance on Letterman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ripped it off from her. Yeah. Let's run that clip now. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> was there a time where you had, is there anything that you had to tell John, like, uh, maybe we don't do a certain part of it just because you know, for whatever you were thinking this special should look like, is there, anything, is there any editing that you did as you were putting the show together? Um, I mean, what was so incredible, I mean, John being one of like the greatest writers of his generation, right, like had worked this material for like two years, and so he was really confident in what he knew it was, really open in the post process for like being like, let's look for trims or reordering things, but um, it was a real gift that, in my role because it was sort of fully baked and brilliant, and we were just trying to communicate the experience of what it was like to be at Boston Symphony Hall in February, yeah. I was very happy that we, we both agreed on not st on starting mid show though, which um, was great. I, I think I think I have I have a lot of problems with the beginnings of shows, and I, I find it the most uncomfortable part is walking out, and people are excited, and I, I don't know why it's not. I don't mean like a. Uh, I'm happy people are excited. I, no, I, I don't know how mean. to. I, I don't know what to do with that. Yeah, because you know, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, will you give us a how's everybody doing anyway, just so you, we missed it? How is everyone doing? All right, this is it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, David, how soon, uh, how far along uh, in this process did uh, John ask you to make music for it? Uh, where, I don't know where you were. Had you, had you week, already shot it? It was the week before. Yeah. The week before you shot it. <laughs> and then at first I was told, and we need it like in three weeks or something really short, uh, or at least seemed really short to me. Yeah. And that got extended a little bit, a little bit. But Our post time was going to be really short at one point. Yeah, it was yeah. going to be like, we shot it, we'll put it together, and we'll have it on, you know, on TV almost, you know, really quickly. Yeah. And I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah so I started, uh, I thought, ah. Uh, mm. I started sending you things that I had. I said, well, here's a jaunty little little tune, mm -hmm. <laughs> and here's a, and John sent me references of things that I had done in the past that he liked. Yeah, that, it was, I, I, that was a great. I was listening to David's album, The Forest, a lot, and, uh, and Catherine Wheel and a lot of um, instrumental stuff that you'd done, and I was like, I wish this could be the music for the special. And I thought about that for months and months, and then, uh, way too late in the process, uh, <laughs> in order to give you a healthy calendar, I thought, you know, I do know him. I could, <laughs> I could ask. Uh, and that was a little, yeah, that was, I remember thinking, like, you could have just um, uh, gotten the nerve earlier and given him more time to do this. But, but sending those examples or naming those examples was super help, helpful. You can narrow it down. It wasn't just throwing, well, how about something like this? How about something like this? It was more like, well, we've narrowed it down a little bit. You, I, th I described you wanted something slightly, slightly melancholy and emotional, but also kind of with a, a, a kind of bounce and yeah. energy to it. Yeah, it had a those Latin. two conflicting things. There was like a Latin feel to it too, as well. That I a little, I, yeah, I really a little bit that too. Yes, and uh, I thought, okay, this is somehow in my mind reflective of the subject matter. It had a perseverance to it that I liked. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I had a, a move. I really mean it. it had a, a movement to it, and and a lot of uh, a lot of bittersweet moments that I that were very rang really true. The what I what I sent John and what I've ended up recording. I've recorded a completely in instrumental version, and a version where, because this is where, where it came from, there was one where I sang the the main melody which was later played by, I think, a violin and an accordion and something else. And uh, I think maybe you used a little bit of both versions. And at some point, the people at Netflix said, can you, can you send us the words to your vocal ver version? And there were, there were no words. I was just singing. <laughs> <laughs> I was singing nonsense, except at the very end where I just go, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. Yeah. And I thought, okay. Yeah, that's the lyric, yeah. That's the lyric. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you record at home or is there like a studio that you go to to do something like this? I, I do oh, the writing at home, but then this had to be in a studio. It was like an accordion player and bass clarinets and all kinds of other things. And you did it in Austin. I did it in Austin, Texas. There's a, a, an arranger that I worked with before, a guy named Steve, Stephen Barber, that I really liked. And he is connected with musicians who can play all these things. Somebody who can play like a, a great kind of uh, Tex-Mex accordion, and then somebody who can play bass clarinet and all the kind of things. And I thought, oh, that'll be some nice sounds in there. Stephen Barber did David's album, Grown Backwards, which is one of my absolute favorites. So Thank that was, so that was really cool that he was in, in, involved. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll get to this one now. Okay, my name's Marty, and I'm in the balcony. Oh, right. <laughs> Still. For, for the four of you, artistic evolutions aside, was there a defining moment in your respective careers that tipped the scales towards you being confident in your ability to create engaging slash relatable art? Ooh. 
So the key, the key to the whole question is defining moment. So that made you like confident in your ability. So like where you're like, hmm, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> oh, that's not how I took it. Um, confident in my ability See, to create engaging. Okay. Well, what came to mind was not a moment of confidence, but uh, I think in 2005, I was um, featuring, which is the middle set on a stand-up uh, show at a, at a club. Uh, there's an MC, a feature, and then the headliner. And I was at the Stress Factory in New Jersey, which is the name of a comedy club there. And <laughs> I was bombing for uh, two nights, really, really, and I had, I did a lot of stuff down at Rafifi and in the East Village, and I, I felt like, no, I felt like this is, I'm not so weird that this won't work on the road, um, but uh, I was really, I was sort of like, I was taking a lot of material I'd worked out in alternative rooms and trying it at a club, and it was not going well. And uh, this comedian who was headlining named, named Ross Bennett uh, said to me after a show, he goes, you're very funny, but these people have no time for your cleverness. <laughs> and he goes, get to the point. And I realized that my premises were all kind of, I'm going to walk you towards an interesting little notion as opposed to starting the bit with the premise, saying, I don't like X. Now, here's a bunch of reasons why. So you took it as advice then. You really took it to heart. Oh, yeah. Just that clarity is the most important thing. And, and some kind of little vignette that meanders that might land somewhere funny might not be what people want when they've gotten a babysitter and were at the stress factory. <laughs> And it felt like a good marriage. I didn't feel like I was abandoning my whole voice or something. It felt like a nice wow. drive. Yeah. I had a very different answer that was more like literal, uh, where I had been doing like stand up, like doing characters and stuff like that. Yeah. And then, this is before I was on SNL, then I got a, a spot on uh, Conan's show, on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. And it was when, so I sort of auditioned it at a club but it's when they bought me a plane ticket. Oh, wow. When I was like, ooh, a free plane ticket. <laughs> that I felt like that's, that, that was a sort of tipping scale of like, oh, this could be something professional. Oh, wow, yeah. But I'm sorry it's not more of an artistic answer. <laughs> but I it know, often is a pragmatic, it often is a, a, a practical, pragmatic thing that really gives you that confidence, you know? Yeah. It's not enough to buy you a plane ticket. Yeah, or that I'm not thinking about the artfulness of it. I'm like, well, something worked out that yeah. they want me to do it on the show. Yeah. Um, what about you guys? Me? Uh, <laughs> I took it to, I took the question to mean, did, was there a point where you thought, oh, I have not completely run out of material. I haven't completely drained the bucket, and it's like, oh, you mean I can continue to do this? Oh. And maybe I'll Maybe there's other songs I can write or other things I can do. Um, yeah, that was, that took a long time to figure out. That, have the confidence to go, yes, I can, I can do this. Even though I have nothing in my head at the moment. I'll, I'll come up with something. And then I'll do it and, you know, show it to a friend and they'll go, I don't think so, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and you just had it from, because you'd done it before? Like you just like, it, hap it happened once before, it'll probably happen again? I, I have to believe that now because I've done it so many times. But uh, at some point you go, what if I sit down and start and go, oh, I'm going to come up with some materials and write something. And you go, oh, there's nothing there. It's all gone. I've used it all up. Well, maybe I haven't. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I wrote a song recently, so this may be the part of like going down. I wrote a song about <laughs> using this incredible moisturizer. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. This may be like, I may, I may have gotten to the bottom of the well. <laughs> when I was right out of college, can't follow that, um, 
I had a little downtown theater company that I ran, and we, of course, wanted to make really aggressive, visceral theater, and we would make theater and no one would come. And we, <laughs> we did theater in a brothel on Ludlow Street that had been transformed and into a theater from a, but the, the brothel stalls were still down in the basement. And then it was uh, in 2006, you said stalls so casually as if, <laughs> as we, if we, we all know, know the layout yeah. of them. Right? All right. Um, and uh, in 2006, we created a, uh, at St. Anne's Warehouse, a Christian evangelical haunted house called a Hell House, where you go through, and these are, it's a phenomenon in Texas and Colorado, and you go through and they have like a script and it's sort of like a scared straight thing. There's like a, you know, going to a club, how dangerous that is, you could die. There's like a Columbine scene, like, you know, it's just, it's, it's distasteful. Um, and uh, we, we, had a chalkboard just outside of where like you would walk through and we had these like chalk marks on for how many people uh, nightly fainted or threw up in the first 15 minutes. And once we filled up that board, I was like, we did it. We made visceral theater. <laughs> <laughs> so John, do you, you, can you still, I don't mind seeing like when a comedian you know does jokes that I've heard before. Can you still tour any of that? No. I think that's no. I think no. Um, but when I'm older, uh, like when I'm 80 and doing Vegas and stuff, I'm going to. Which you laugh, but like I'm excited. Like it's. <laughs> I really am. Like it's a great. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, showbiz. Oh, uh, I. The older I get, the more I agree with that. Yeah. Where I wouldn't understand, like, why? Yeah. Why do that? And I'm like, that must be pretty good to be somewhere for a, a month. Yeah. You, have a, you rent in, a house out, you know, in the desert, and, uh, you know, you, sort of, you walk around all day in linen pants or something, and then you go, <laughs> and you have the same meal, and you do your show, and, yeah. you know, the win or something. Yeah, and, and the audience is happy. Yeah, or not. I mean, they're fine. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's kind of like, it's like, oh, there he is, you know? Yeah. Um, so I was thinking about this recently. I was like, I'll just do, like, I'll do old stuff then. I'll do, like, you know, the hits, and then at the end I'll have, like, a song, you know, like, <laughs> like oh, so many memories or something. You know? Do you think there'll be a season two of Baby, Baby J? J? Uh, we're working on it now. Uh, <laughs> Um, that's funny that everyone clapped. That was a joke. Uh, there's not a season. There's no season two of a uh, Baby J, but um... well, don't say that. Okay. We don't know. Yeah. I feel bad that like, I mean, were we supposed to have been like really doing bits? Sometimes when I watch these things, people are like, oh, you know, like when there's yeah. comedians, they're like, they're like really getting into it and like. I know. Telling these stories, like you, you should have seen John. And John, yeah. hand, to, hand to God, straight face, walks up, <laughs> orders. I, no, and, and the guy at the beach is just—he's like, "What just walked in?" Yeah. Th th there's a tone that. Uh, yeah, there's uh, a there's a a fun like, and yeah. we'd be doubling over. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a. I hope. I think we had some of that. <laughs> it's the doubling over that. But I don't, I don't always enjoy watching that, but I just feel like no, so I much of it is, is don't. But I did over. think, you know, as we went down, we did that question. Remember when Marty in the balcony asked a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we went down the line, and my, I, after my answer, I was like, what are you, what are you, who do you think you are? Being like, and he told me, get to the point. And I was like, I was like what a bad anecdote. Uh, but, um, and then their answers were better. And I, I, was I just, know, it was, I know. That's okay, it's okay to always But they worry. just know how to do it, you know. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Oh, yes, let's see. I, so when I already asked how much thought goes into picking a suit, um, this is for John. Did, uh, did you see any ghosts today? Oh. Uh, I thought about it, no. Um, I thought, I was I'm staying at a hotel that's in an old building, and I thought I, I actually did not, I'm not, just trying to come up with an answer for the question. I did think I see, saw like a, 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 a movement and I thought, well, it is an old building. Um, and uh, is this, is 92Y haunted at all? No, don't think so, okay. 
a lot of venues, it's fun to tour because a lot of venues, you know, a lot of old theaters are haunted and uh, you just ask the stage manager, like, is this place haunted? And they go, yeah. And <laughs> the Midlands Theater in Kansas City is haunted by a janitor who was blown up by a bomb that an anarchist planted in the early 1900s. And I ask them, I go, what is he doing when you see the ghost? And they go, he's cleaning up the lobby. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I once, <laughs> one time I lived in a house and uh, someone who was like sort of moving me in there like told me like, you know, I think this place is haunted. Do you want me to get rid of these spirits? And I was like, I don't care. If there's like, <laughs> if there are ghosts, they're just, what's wrong with them hanging out? I don't need every bit of space, like, you know, like, get out. I'm like, I don't care. Knock yourself out. You want to But even around? if you could see them, if they, like. I don't think, I think it was like a, because she said, she's like, no, I have a feeling. Oh. And I was like, I don't, that's fine. Let that have be. You, have you two ever seen a ghost? No. No, I can't say I have. <laughs> you know what's interesting is. No, like, I'm Catholic. Like, no one, I mean, I was raised Catholic. No one likes, it's not that no one likes Catholic people, but like, no, it's not a popular thing. Um, and no one, and people have a lot of problems with Catholic priests, uh, and that, we all know why. And so, <laughs> but whenever, whenever you have, like, a demon in your home, I, and no, none of us would call anyone but a Catholic priest. Like, if you actually want to do battle with a demon, you're not going to be like, oh, there's a female cantor at my synagogue. It's really, it's really great. <laughs> like, I would call the, mo the most elderly, homophobic, mean priest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone who hates the devil, like, personally. <laughs> You've never worked in a haunted theater of any kind? Oh, sure, of course, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You just didn't see anything? No, I, I haven't been lucky enough. I've had rats run across our tech tables. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. You go into a meeting, you leave out your sandwich, and come back, and it's like a fiesta, yeah. Wow. I bet rats are the, a major cause of what people think were hauntings. Oh. Oh, I'm saying like over the centuries. I bet you also, rats know a ton about theaters, and about how to fix broken musicals. When you think about those rats that live in those out of town tryout things, they've seen so many shows come and go, yeah. people try to fix it. Yeah. They have a collective knowledge that we yeah. could only hope for. Yeah. You know? Oh, like they're up there, like they don't have a second act. Yeah. <laughs> At a mega mix. Yeah. I'm very excited that you two are bringing Here Lies Love to Broadway very, very soon. When does that start? We start previews in the 17th. Nice. That's really soon. <laughs> wow. Um, You've been with this, how long was it since you developed the, the album of Here Lies Love? Wow. When was that? It was like 13 years ago, something like that, yes. I, I, couldn't get any theater or any place interested in doing it, so I thought, okay, I'll, do, I'll make a record so, so I can go, this is, this is what it should be like, which I did, and I, yeah, did that, and I said, yeah, and it should be like a karaoke, immersive, musical, in, kind of in a disco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, and the audience is, uh, part of the audience is in the middle of the stage, from what I remember. Yeah. Um, oh, when it was downtown. Yeah. It's still going to be like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, standing, moving around, sort of immersed in the action, yeah. The, so when you're working on something like this for so long, do you find yourself thinking about Imelda Marcos like a lot? Like has your feelings on her changed throughout the process? Oh, uh, she, she's still alive, in case, in case anyone wondered. Uh, she is? She is still alive. Does she know about the show? She does know. I don't know if she knows that it's coming to Broadway right now, but she knew about she it when we did about it before. The show. She knew about it when we did it before. Um, she never saw it, but apparently she thought, oh, this is very sweet. They made a musical about me. <laughs> <laughs> like it's her Evita or something. <laughs> 
think I think she'd be pretty displeased once she yes, saw the content. Yes, though. yes. Yeah. Well, I I feel like I, I could be here all night, but I feel like we're good. <laughs> right? like, it's, there were like so many high points to sort of end on instead of us just sort of meandering. Although, like, I mean, if it were up to me, I'd do like another like half an hour of audience questions. But I don't. I don't but it's not up to me. It's not up to me. Well, um, see you later, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> what if we do? I don't think this, this isn't planned. But what if we do like I don't know three. Yeah, see, that's a lot of pressure on the third person. They have to have a really fun, open question that is, uh, you know, gives us a lot of room to end on a huge, fun note. Yeah, or, or whatever the last one is, we could do one of those crazy showbiz anecdotes where we're doubled over. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I, um, we'll exaggerate it. Yeah, and, like, yeah. and then, okay, so let's do, um, if we can have house lights, please. Um, hey, there we go. Okay, so let's take some questions. We'll start uh, somewhere in the middle. Oh, right, right, right over there, yes. Right, uh, sure, yeah. That's fine. Oh, um, what was your name, sorry? Siggy. Siggy? Yeah. Nice to meet you, I'm John. Um, <laughs> that, I, I wonder, I, I, you know, the, the hesitancy I had, and it's, it's in part why sometimes um, these organizations are anonymous in recovery, because none of us wants to represent what recovery should be for anyone else. It's a very, I mean, we can all relate to each other, but it's a very private road. And so I, something that I was, I hopefully was very respectful of was not trying to say this is what it's like, but just to say this is what it was like for me. And um, so uh, I, I also didn't want to get my expectations uh, up that I would um, definitely be, uh, how do I say this? I thought it would I thought it would be pretty arrogant to think I'm helping people with the show. And I first and foremost wanted it to be really funny and entertaining and, 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 and still have some, and still be show business, but talking about this. Could I do this type of story um, in a bright red suit uh, in front of a lot of amazing neoflex with amazing music and, and it's still a presentation, you know? Um, I won't lie that I hope that it did uh, I hope it did connect with people. Um, if there was one thing I was trying to communicate is that it's, uh, you know, you can, make, you can make a lot of mistakes and you still, it's one thing to recover from things happening to you, but when you are also the cause of them, it's a little strange to be moving forward after that because you do sort of feel like you did it to you. Uh, that was just an idea that I wanted to get out to the audience. And again, not say, any conclusion. I didn't want any bow on the show. I didn't want it wrapped up because it never is. But thanks for that question. I appreciate it. God. Um, all right, right here in the middle. Hi. Oh, so at the end of the special, I read that GQ interview that um, I would say, uh, yes, yes, and then uh, Frazier, Fra uh, yeah, yeah, Frazier, uh, he saw the show uh, and saw me read it, and then um, I haven't read what he wrote, but I heard that, that he didn't know there was anything wrong with me when I gave the interview, <laughs> which I find you know, the, the sort of self-preservationist is like, good, good, I was, you know. But um, that, was, that was part of the problem, was uh, 
you know, I, th at the first rehab I was at, uh, uh, I was only there for a month, but the, my uh, counselor there, he said, you present very well, and that's what terrifies me. <laughs> and I thought, uh, with Fraser, I thought, wow, I, I was even in that looped interview. Uh, and I remember vaguely, like, I was staying at a friend's parents' apartment. It was, everything was so chaotic. But I sat down and gave a long interview to GQ. Uh, <laughs> I was sort of, yeah, I was a bit, a bit uh, creeped out, but also proud of myself for convincing GQ I was all right that day. Uh, someone in the balcony, maybe, to be fair. I can't really see up there, but maybe that direction right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you in the checkered shirt towards the back, yes. Hi. Uh, my question for y'all, what's y'all's favorite chips? Chips? <laughs> uh, we get this so much. <laughs> I don't think I've seen you eat like a snack food. <laughs> what was that type of uh, um, like uh, green tea ice cream you would get on writing night at SNL? Uh, it had like we went to the dinners or something. No, no, no. You would get it delivered. Uh, uh, it was like a. Uh, was it called like it was a company called like Red Mango or something? Red Mango. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's not a chip. In, that's not a chip. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I just am thinking about Fred snacking, and I don't know if I ever saw. Well, I like. Um, uh, I'll have some tortilla chips with something, or like sometimes if there's like pita chips, you know, like they're like crunchy, and. Not the soft kind, but it's like crunchy pita chips always seem like, oh, I'm having a partial meal. For the first 29 years of my life, there were no dark blue potato chips. And then <laughs> one day, there were suddenly lots of very dark blue, nearly purple potato chips yeah. available. Yeah. And um, I don't know what that's about. And I, I would say I eat pretzels, David. Salt and vinegar. Uh, <laughs> Why does that get applause? <laughs> I'm with David. I'm with David. Yeah. Salt and vinegar. Salt and vinegar. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just to end, I got. I have one quick question for both of you. Well, we can. T oh, sorry. I'll do that. <laughs> yes, you. 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 I sir. said three. Uh, what, for each of you, what is your favorite musical group of all time to you? And what one song of theirs would be your number one of that group? Mm. Wait, what was the last part of the question? What's your favorite musical group? That part what I heard. song of theirs? Oh, for me, it's, um, for me, it's Sleater Kinney, and it's the song, uh, Get Up. Oh, uh, I'm going to embarrass David. Uh, I would say it's the Talking Heads, and uh, I, lo I love the song, the song "Warning Signs." That's one of my favorites. And I'm only, and I'm embarrassing you, but I also have a quick, funny anecdote, which is uh, uh, when uh, I was hosting Saturday Night Live and you were on. Uh, I was very excited uh, that you were going to do "Once in a Lifetime." And uh, I was in Lauren Michaels' office, and I walked in and I said, um, did you hear uh, David's going to do Once in a Lifetime? And he went, oh, I wish he'd do Letting the Days Go By. <laughs> I, w <laughs> I remember uh, after the rehearsal that day, I was invited to the the meeting that Lauren has up in the office where yeah. go, oh, we're going to cut this bit or do, change this and this bit and whatever. And he said something to me that I think I he thought I was performing the song and I was a little too angry or something. He gave you a note? He on gave me a note. <laughs> I can't oh, believe it. I was flattered. I, I was flattered. I would tell everybody, I got a note from Lauren Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing once in a lifetime too angry. <laughs>
Uh, favorite group and song, gentlemen? Uh, George Jones, maybe. He Stopped Loving Her Today. You know that song? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Weezer fan. A Weezer fan. Oh. So, the salt and vinegar of bands, yeah. apparently. Yeah. So for me, it would be Across the Sea by Weezer. Yeah. Wow. What do you think? I'm enjoying it too much. Let's, Let's do one more. Let's. Wait, I have a quick question before we continue. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. David, do you think you would be able to do, not now, um, stand up comedy at some point in your life? And John, do you think you'd be able to write a song? Like a. Ooh. Um, I would. Uh, I like trying to write songs. Yeah, I really like trying to write lyrics. I, I enjoy it a lot. Uh, I like that the children's special that I did with America Sawyer and Eli Berman. That, uh, that's, I, that's I, I, songs I really, in that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I really, I really enjoyed writing lyrics. Uh, David, would you do do stand up? I uh, actually, I would love to, but it's terrifying. <laughs> you don't have like the whole support thing of band and here, here's the train, this, the song is the train tracks and you just stay on the tracks and you're okay. I thought, but there's something about just talking, talking to a, a group of people, it's kind of thrilling. <laughs> Do you have a sense of how much of an influence you are on comedians? No. Oh, okay, you are. Uh, <laughs> and, endless. Yeah, huh? endless. Yeah. yeah, my my mom is here, and she uh, she knows. Uh, uh, and and I I I don't want to put you through this, but you're a, a tremendous influence on my life, on my comedic life. Yeah, tremendous. There, there was something so f you infused so much comedy into music, and 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 but it was like serious music, but it was. Yeah, it wasn't comedy music. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had the, I don't know, it had the like uh, funny people in the back of the class feeling, you know? <laughs> and the, the interviews you did with yourself uh, that I, I think at the end of Stop Making Sense, I, I had a VHS and at the end you interview yourself in a variety of characters. That was like a big, yeah. that was a big that was influence huge. on me. I thought that was so funny. When David was doing American Utopia, the comedians would come over and over. Yeah. Well, I think you, could, I think you should try it sometime. <laughs> I think it'd be good. Yes, sir. If you were not professional friends, would you be personal friends? <laughs> <laughs> if so. I would like to believe that, yes, we would be friends. I feel like we're, because I think with work, if you kind of don't, uh, aren't aligned with someone, you can feel that right away, too. Just, I feel very, uh, whenever we talk or hang out, I feel like yeah. it's very natural. Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, I have this thing with a few people where I'm like, I would have known you even if we hadn't gone in. I don't know what we'd be doing. <laughs> But um, yeah, and also it's, I, I have not worked, I haven't um, worked in, I haven't worked with someone, I, I, you, I think I need to be, uh, I need to get along with the people I work with. It just makes life a lot better. Um, and Alex, we would have met. I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and David, we would have met, you know. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> You have another thing? What? Yeah, we're gonna start another one. You have another talk tonight? I think it might be time to say goodnight. Okay. Oh. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all for real. Thank, thank you. you all so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>